We're here today to have what I am sure is going to be a very interesting discussion on a topic that, for any number of reasons, um, is quite timely, if you read the daily news. Um, as the invitation said, the topic is going to be framed around a recent USIP special report uh, entitled, When Should We Talk to Terrorists? by Audrey Kurt Cronin. The very first line of that report states that this is a a topic that generates a lot of passion, uh, but scarce light. Uh, And it is for these reasons that, or for this reason, that USIP is really proud and it's very important to us to support evidence-based research of the kind that that Dr. Cronin uh, conducts. And we'll hear a little bit more about the results of that research in a moment. We have a very esteemed panel today, and we provided their bios out on the table. If some of you came in this way, there's also quite a few materials related to this topic out on the table. I'm not going to do lengthy introductions, but let me just highlight a few few things about each of our panelists. Audrey Kurth Cronin, our our guest of honor, our first among equals, um, is coming to the end of her uh, USIP grant that supported not only the special report But what we think is a really interesting and groundbreaking book entitled How Terrorism Ends, Um, and there's information on that book out on the table as well. Uh, William Zartman, familiar to many in the room, he's had four USIP grants. Audrey, you have some catching up to do. Um, Has come at this topic from a a range of perspectives. Um, Most recently, he's co-edited a a book uh, entitled Engaging with Extremists. States and Terrorists Negotiating Ends and Means. Anthony Juanis, in addition to his position at American University, uh, is an instructor here in the USIP Academy uh, and teaches a course on negotiation, and we'll be looking at this issue from a negotiation perspective. Peter Bergen uh, is a current USIP grantee um, doing really interesting work on the grievance structure of various groups in Afghanistan and Pakistan, clearly related to this issue as well. Finally, we have Paul Pilar here, who is the Director of Graduate Studies at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at Georgetown University. And as you'll see from his bio, has a wealth of policy experience uh, that relates to this topic. He's wrestled with these issues. We're very fortunate to have him to moderate the discussion we'll have after the presentations. So what we're going to do is have 10-minute presentation by each of our panelists. After that, we'll have, I think, a good amount of time for discussion. Today's event is being webcast, and there is also media in the room, so we ask questioners to please come uh, to one of the microphones we have set up. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Cronin to come to the microphone. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to be back at the Institute of Peace, um, a place that's very dear to my heart. Before I get started, though, since I am an employee at the National Defense University, I should point out that everything I'm about to say is strictly my own opinion, my own academic research. It does not in any way represent anyone but myself, uh, and that includes the Department of Defense and any of the other agencies involved. So with that as a caveat, I'm going to talk about the report that you have um, access to a copy of. And I only have about 10 minutes to give you an overview of some of the general conclusions. So uh, it's going to be a fairly broad presentation where I won't be able to get into a lot of the details of how I came to these conclusions, but I hope you'll have the time to uh, possibly read the report and even potentially um, have a look at the book because all of the statistical data is described uh, in the book and also on a website that's accessible through... um, Uh, that is referred to in the book. So for those of you that are statistically oriented or who want a lot more detail about any any of the case studies, you're not going to be satisfied with what I say today in 10 minutes, but you might at least um, achieve a little bit more uh, uh, of an idea of what I did by looking at the other things. Well, this question of negotiating with people that target civilians for a symbolic purpose is understandably repulsive to many people. The natural impulse of governments is to crush terrorist groups that attack their citizens. 
the natural, that's very natural and understandable, particularly in the aftermath of a tragic event. The priority is to shore up the safety of the population, to stabilize the state, to avoid legitimizing the group that attacked, to punish those responsible, and to show, quote unquote, that terrorism doesn't pay. This is one reason why if you look through the broad history of terrorism, you can see that strong states typically respond with very strong measures, particularly military and police repression. Uh, it's very logical. It's an instinctive part of how states are structured. Uh, nobody wants to appease, quote unquote, terrorist groups. It's hardly surprising that strong states respond the way they do. But sometimes classic state counterterrorist measures like military repression, policing, infiltration of groups, targeted killings, arrests, reform movements, or even marginalization of a group, sometimes those things are insufficient on their own to end a campaign. There may be no viable alternative to entering into talks. So the purpose of my research, particularly that which is focused on this report, was to answer the questions that are faced by policymakers when they're thinking about the prospects of negotiating with groups that use a, what is a repulsive tactic. Those questions include when and why do governments and groups negotiate? Under what conditions are those negotiations promising or unpromising? And how can we assess whether a particular terrorist campaign is more or less likely to end through talks. And again, as, I've, as we've mentioned, the focus on negotiations was part of a broader project that addressed the question of how exactly terrorist campaigns end. Foc I focus on the question of collective uh, talks with groups that use terrorism, not individual measures like amnesties. Um, and the book employed three approaches to try to answer that question. Um, first, a detailed history of the of terrorist campaigns over approximately the last couple of centuries. Secondly, a series of controlled comparative case studies of the decline and ending of specific campaigns. And then finally, a database of uh, campaigns which included hundreds, uh, almost 500, um, and studied exactly how they had declined and ended. So I'll give a brief overview, as I said, of some of the conclusions. First, Negotiation can indeed lead to the achievement of some of the aims of a group and a short-term decline in terrorism. There are many examples that are included in my study. Some of the familiar ones include uh, the provisional IRA, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process in the 1990s, the Tamil Tigers in the early part of this century, and so on. But as these examples that I've just mentioned painfully demonstrate, the picture is a lot more complicated than simply the pursuit of a negotiated agreement and then the ending of violence. With talks, the long-term goal, which is a viable political outcome, a stable political outcome oftentimes, and the short-term goal, which is a reduction in violence itself, may be at odds. The good news is that from the state's perspective, overall, only about 5% of terrorist campaigns, including those who negotiate but also those who end in other ways, only about 5% of them succeed in achieving their aims as they describe them. And again, the most common scenario is for groups that use this tactic to die young. Second, only a small percentage of groups, about 18% by my calculation, these numbers are never precisely exact, but somewhere in that range, about 18% negotiate at all. These tend to be long-lived groups. The average lifespan of groups that negotiate is between 20 and 25 years. If you look at the average lifespan of groups overall, at least the groups that were in my database, um, it's only about eight years. So they're, they're longer-lived groups. That seems to make sense because they're hanging around longer to talk with. So of that 18%, one in 10 of the talks fail outright. On the other hand, very few groups can be said, again, to have fully achieved their aims. The predominant pattern in negotiations with groups that use terrorism is for talks to drag on with some lower level of violence without resolution or outright failure. Essentially, the negotiations become a diversion of the violence to another channel, while another dynamic typically enters the picture to help lead to the group's demise. So it's a little bit artificial to talk about negotiations completely independently of other aspects of the particular context. Negotiations rarely throughout history and groups 
completely on their own. So those who claim that talks alone end terrorism are just as wrong as those who insist that governments must never negotiate with terrorists. Under certain circumstances, talks are a necessary but not sufficient condition for reaching the end. Negotiations, therefore, are best approached as a long-term managed process requiring patience and a broad range of policy tools. Now, with that as the broad overview, there are seven promising and unpromising conditions for negotiations that are drawn from all of the case studies and the database and the historical study. The promising conditions that I've concluded come up, uh, that, that I've come up with include, first, the existence of a political stalemate on both sides. The emphasis here in my work is on the political element, because groups are more likely to negotiate when they sense that their popular support is waning. On the other hand, if the domestic constituency of the state is shifting in directions that serve a group's interests or respond favorably, at least from a group's perspective, to violence, then it will wait to negotiate. So in short, the broader audiences are a key element in determining whether or not the moment is right for negotiations. Essentially, I think you need to see, particularly as we move into the 21st century, negotiations as not just a dichotomous relationship between any given group and any status quo power, but something that has a third side to the triangle that is becoming increasingly more important relative to the other two. And that is the role of the audiences or the popular support or the mobilized groups that are or are not supporting those talks or the violence. So that's the first key thing to keep in mind, I think. Secondly... A promising condition is strong leadership on both sides. This is obvious from the government side, but what is interesting is the need for leadership on the group side in many cases. A strong charismatic leader on the terrorist side who pursues talks and can at least pretend to distance him or herself from the violence, frankly it's almost always himself, but in any case (laughs) pretends to distance that person from the violence, can be equally crucial if the goal is a negotiated outcome. Talks may become more difficult after a leadership change because the group may become more diffuse. So this debate that's going on right now about the question of whether or not targeted killings work or decapitation or drone killings and so on work is extremely complicated. And uh, when it comes specifically to talks, the question of whether or not you have a leader with whom to negotiate is very important. Third, under the promising conditions, is third-party sponsors or mediators. These are crucial, especially in terrorist campaigns, because these groups are typically clandestine and unwilling to meet with government representatives directly, and also because the domestic political cost to a government that reaches out to a group directly is very high in many cases. Third-party sponsors can act as well as outside guarantors, so their role becomes very important. And a fourth promising element Uh, for entering talks is the broader historical setting, particularly the relationship between terrorist groups who share sources of inspiration internationally. Looking at campaigns that have actually ended in a negotiated agreement, they have all included, especially in recent history, groups whose cause had peaked on the international stage. In the 20th century, I would argue that included groups um, that were part of the wave of decolonization. Talks with groups whose global cause is perceived to be rising in terms of broad-based political support and connections with other comparable groups inspired by the same kinds of ideas tend to be unpromising. Now, three unpromising conditions uh, in addition to those four promising conditions that I discussed. First is suicide attacks. This is an unpromising factor for successful negotiations because they reduce the ability and the willingness of populations to live side by side. Second, splintering. It's a very common outcome of opening talks. There are many examples that you'll think of immediately, the provisional IRA splintering into its many um, individual uh, elements uh, and splinter groups, the real IRA, continuity IRA, and so on, uh, the PLO, all of those splinter groups. Dividing groups can be a purpose of the negotiations, and it potentially strangles the most radical factions. But splintering can also occur on the status quo side, usually the pro-government side in this case. In South Africa, with the Afrikaner White Powers Group Farmers Force in Northern Ireland. They were splintering on the pro-status quo side with the Ulster Volunteer Force. The most extreme case of splintering uh, of status quo factions, I would argue, is Colombia, where the signing of the peace accords between the Colombian government and the Popular Liberation Army in 1984 
resulted in the formation of right-wing paramilitary groups. Before long, leftist groups, paramilitary units, the Colombian army all stepped up their attacks, increasing the violence. Again, in the short term, talks do not necessarily decrease the violence. A third and final, final unpromising condition would be spoilers, the existence of spoilers. And there's been considerable research done on this within the academic community. But as is the case in talks with uh, civil, those that are involved in civil wars, spoilers may decrease the likelihood of successful talks. But the cause and effect in terrorist attacks is complex. In the presence of a foundation of popular support for the talks, strong outside guarantors, and identification of the negotiators with the talks themselves, spoiler attacks can actually strengthen the process if there's the ability of those who are involved in the talks to condemn and delegitimize the violence itself. The key variable is whether or not they have a plan to do so. So just to sum up, uh, this has been a sort of a huge, broad overview, and I realize uh, it's a little bit frustrating to get into, not to be able to get into the details, but again, the report is there. Negotiations are best thought of as a way to move a conflict toward the ending of a campaign in conjunction with other classic means of ending terrorism. Again, the violence rarely ends with the opening of talks. If talks are entered, a key consideration for policymakers is to consider these seven promising and unpromising aspects that I've gone through, to approach the talks as a process that will trundle along and in most cases take considerable time, and to build a strategic plan for communications in advance if the virtually inevitable violence occurs. Thank you, uh, Audrey. And let me add my, uh, to what Andrew said earlier, my uh, greeting to all of you and your thanks for coming out. We did not agree on uh, an order of march here, but uh, I would propose that for the rest of the panelists we go in the uh, order on your printed program, which I think happens to be alphabetical once we get past Audrey. So that would be uh, Peter Bergen and then Anthony and then Bill. So, uh, Peter, if we could uh, have your observations, please. Thank you very much, Paul, and, uh, and thank you very much to USIP for this invitation, and, and thank you, Audrey, for her brilliant work. I just wanted to sort of free associate about the, the four promising and three unpromising um, conditions as they relate to the Taliban uh, that Audrey laid out. Uh, so promising conditions, is there a political stalemate, and does, is the Taliban losing uh, group support? I would say um, yes and no, because, I mean, the polling data on the Taliban indicates that their favorable ratings never go above 10 percent, right now about 7 percent. So they certainly don't enjoy a great deal of popular support, but unscientific polling in Helmand and Kandahar indicates that their support may be about 27 uh, percent, according to a relatively recent poll. Strong leadership on both sides. Um, well, Hamid Karzai. Uh, Mullah Omar, uh, Zadari. <laughs> you know, these don't seem like very strong leaders on a lot of levels. I mean, Kiani, I think, is clearly somebody who uh, I think wants to bring some form of resolution to this, uh, but perhaps uh, you know the question of the Akani network is still very much on the table. Third-party sponsors to to facilitate a deal. Uh, the Saudi government obviously is going to play is playing potentially a large role. If Mullah Omar retires, he's not going to retire to to Kabul, he'll probably retire to Mecca. And that's true also of Gulbuddin Hekmatcher and a number of these guys are not going to be able to... Gulbuddin Hekmatcher is sort of a war criminal by any standard. Um, it would be very hard to imagine him coming back to Afghanistan. And uh, just as Zadari went to Saudi Arabia during his... Uh, uh, um, pardon me, when um, uh, Nawaz Sharif went to Saudi Arabia, you know, Idi Amin, there's a sort of long... Uh, tradition of Saudi being a place of, of exile that, that a number of people will, will agree to. Another third party sponsor, of course, is the United States, which um, the sort of a kiss of death problem, I would suspect, for much of the Taliban, but obviously our ability to uh, engage with the Pakistanis is, is, is a fairly large one. Is the context promising? Um, in a, in a way, yes. I'd say there are some very contextual things that are quite promising. The biggest strategic shift since 9-11 is the, the views of the Pakistani public, military, and government about the Taliban. The Taliban enjoyed a sort of religious Robin Hood image uh, for many years, and that has essentially evaporated. Uh, support for suicide bombing in Pakistan has dropped from 33% to 5% in the last several years 
support for bin Laden's dropped from 65% to 18% in the most recent poll. Support for the Taliban is tanking dramatically, basically because of all the things that they've done domestically. And so that is a, that's a change. Um, the Afghan population also uh, is overwhelmingly in favor of talks. So that's another sort of favorable. Then on the unpromising side, uh, suicide attacks, of course, have gone off the charts in Afghanistan. In 2005, there were 17 of them. In 2006, there were 123. And the, the numbers are usually around about 150 a year at the moment. Splintering. Um, the Taliban is very splintered. Can Mullah Omar even deliver most of the quite sure is an interesting question. He, can he deliver Hadakanis? Could he deliver Gulbuddin Hekmatsha? Uh, and I think the short answer in all that is no. So you're dealing with at least four factions, the TTP, the Quetashura, Haqqani, and Hekmatsha, uh, who you'd have to do deals with. And finally, the question of spoilers. Almost all of these guys are potentially spoilers mm-hmm. of one sort or another. So having just... And then I just wanted to, 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 to draw, our te- draw your attention to ten kind of unpromising things in general about this whole, uh, about doing deals with the Taliban. First of all, obviously, a very weak Afghan government. And what can they concede? Is it territory or principle? Does the Taliban get the Ministry of Justice? And how would that go over with the international community? Uh, Mullah Omar has had 10 years now to say al-Qaeda bin Laden, 9-11 was a bad idea, and he has never said anything of the sort. Every time there's been a meeting in the Maldives or Mecca between Afghan government and representatives of the Taliban, the quite sure has very quickly said that this doesn't represent anything uh, to do with us, and that, by the way, our, one, our main demand is the withdrawal of international forces. And, of course, that would mean that they would take Kabul, because the weak, the weak Afghan government and army cannot defend uh, Afghanistan by itself at this point. We've also done a controlled experiment on this issue, issue which was the pre-9-11 period, in which we basically said to Mullah Omar essentially kind of what we're planning to say to him now, which is give up al-Qaeda, bin Laden, and, and we won't attack you. And he, uh, he obviously decided to, uh, uh, to do what we all know he did, suggesting that he's not Henry Kissinger and he's unlikely to be Henry Kissinger in the future. And then the question of who do you deal with? We have so many different factions. Uh, also, the, ta- the fact that the Taliban think that not losing or perhaps even winning, either of those means that you're winning in an insurgency. We've also conducted a number of controlled experiments on the same issue in Pakistan. Every time there's been a peace deal with the Taliban, they've taken advantage in 04 and 05 in southern Waziristan and 09 in SWAT to extend territory and use it to regroup. And then uh, who are the moderate Taliban? Are they the, the Taliban who send their uh, girls to schools once a week or once a month? It's sort of an oxymoron anyway. And the moderate Taliban who are going to moderate have already come over, the Mutawa kills, the others that we know of. And then finally, um, al-Qaeda's influence on the Taliban is fairly pr- pronounced uh, and has, I, th- I think, increased over time. The, 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 this uh, Bayatullah Massoud sent suicide bombers to Barcelona in Spain a couple of years ago, which was re- really a canary in the mine. Faisal Shahzad had just appeared in a video uh, posthumous, uh, uh, obviously after the fact, in which he's standing next to Hakimullah Massoud suggesting that the Taliban have become more ideological and uh, and not less so over time. Uh, Thank you, Peter. Uh, Anthony. Good afternoon. Anthony Wanis from American University. Um, I'd like to talk about the negotiation aspects uh, specifically. Um, Negotiation and terrorism are two very, very packed terms. Uh, negotiation, I will say, and, and I'm sure uh, my, my friend and colleague Bill will say more, uh, can be done very well. It can also be done very poorly, and it doesn't have to be simply as it is often portrayed in military terrorism contexts as simply a, a series of concessions by the state to the opposition. It can be done well. It can be done poorly, strategically, tactically. It can uh, result in implementation or failures of implementation. Um, so we need to be careful as we, as we think about what those terms mean. Terrorism, too, um, despite all the, the different uh, ter- uh, definitional lives, I think we can, we can all probably agree, even if we don't agree on the definitions, that a great deal of military violence finds its way uh, uh, to the civilians, especially in the last several decades. Regardless of who is doing the fighting, civilians end up paying the price. <clears throat> I'd like to, to talk about essentially four things negotiation related with regard to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Audrey's uh, wonderful work. The first is to ask who are we talking to when we talk about negotiation with a terrorist group? Are we thinking about speaking to their top level strategic uh, foundational leaders, 
Are we thinking about talking to their field level military people who have an operational uh, role but who do not make the strategic direction of that movement, uh, but who do direct its activities on a daily basis? Are we talking about the rank and file type people who may uh, not be connected strongly to the ideological currents of their movement and may be uh, occasionally looking for a way out? Um, even when we are talking about discussing having negotiations with top leadership, how solid is that top leadership? Are they uh, going to withstand the rigors of uh, shaking and movement within their own group? Um, will they be able to deliver their group? Are they, uh, do they have a sort of expiration date on their leadership role? Um, as noted by, by several of our other panelists, these movements can uh, and often do face a great deal of fragmentation. Uh, insurgencies and terrorist groups in general, I think that the closer they get to the negotiation table, the more the, the uh, momentum for fragmentation uh, probably increases as those who want to be seen as faithful to the original cause um, begin to engage in tactics that uh, are more on the extreme side. So who we're talking to matters. Um, what kind of talking also matters. Uh, to those who might say we shouldn't talk to people who engage in these sorts of, of behaviors, well, uh, there are some forms of negotiation that might be even useful with your worst adversary. Uh, some of the purposes of negotiation might not be, as I stated, stated earlier, uh, simply a series of concession making in the hope of luring the movement away from its, from its behaviors. It could be for the purpose of gathering intelligence about what their tendencies, interests, <coughs> leadership are. So some sort of uh, engagement with them brings a lot of uh, information directly uh, into the, to the hands of those who engage with them. Negotiation can also be uh, for the purpose of what I might call uh, meta-negotiation or pre-negotiation. You're not talking about the substance of the conflict. You're talking about the terms of possible engagement. Uh, you're talking about what it would take to actually sit down at the table together. Those are very useful kinds of talks. Uh, they often happen in the shadows, and we shouldn't underestimate their importance. They often uh, precede the open sort of talks that, that uh, make the news that we all hear about. The third purpose, I think, and, and one that doesn't get much play, is that negotiation can be used, of course, as a process of trying to get the, if you're on the state side, get the group, the terrorist group, to uh, see their political goals as attainable by other means. Uh, in contrast to the image of simply making uh, uh, concessions to them, getting them to feel that they can be bought into a process that might attain legitimate goals if the means are also legitimate. Uh, Audrey's work, as, as some of my other colleagues and, and certainly my work, has shown that a lot of important negotiations don't happen in the open. And when negotiations are taking place in front of cameras, uh, there are often quiet negotiations taking place elsewhere where the real substance is discussed. And, and that helps to manage some of the political risk, I think, that uh, leaders take on when they uh, are trying to face um, movements engaged in terrorism. Uh, with regard to the Afghanistan example, some, it, it, it occurs to me that there are so many different levels of opposition, um, as, as, as Peter alluded to. Uh, just as in many different uh, conflicts that we've seen around the world, a government responds as if the uprising or movement were a monolith, and there are often many different uh, actors and movements sort of coalescing together. It occurs to me that you have to do an analysis on their ability and willingness to talk separately on each one. Uh, people going out in the th into the street and throwing stones who might be civilian supporters of, of an opposition movement are probably different from the hardcore recruits who would put on a suicide vest. Uh, and those themselves are going to be different from strategic leaders. Uh, engaging with all of them, I think, requires different tactics, different strategies, different approaches. Uh, it certainly seems to me that our armed forces, the folks serving in ISAF, will face people at a mid-field uh, level uh, rank of command in, in, in Afghanistan who are probably willing to come over from the Taliban and bring fighters with them. Uh, our, our military is increasingly looking at ways to equip our commanders with the ability to do those negotiations. Those are not strategic level we are making a reconciliation with the Taliban. They happen rather in, on the, mo in the moment uh, without any prior preparation or planning. Uh, 
and they increasingly are part of what I think are the landscape uh, in that conflict. Let me um, end my comments there and pass the, the mic to, to Bill Zartman. Thank you very much. Bill. I think I'll take the podium just to equalize the forces. <clears throat> and I promise you I resist the temptation to talk about ripeness so you're safe. I noticed that, you, that Audrey mentioned right as well as ripe, so that's, that's a broad concept. <clears throat> First of all, I would say just to stake out positions that I think we should talk with extremists as much as possible. We should negotiate only when, the terms, when terms of trade appear possible. <clears throat> Those are two overlapping terms, and there's a broad gray area in between that uh, that should be more probably a subject of uh, intelligence and uh, uh, operation and strategy than hair splitting on the na uh, nature of the terms. I think it's important to recognize that uh, the government has to say that it will not negotiate with terrorists. So we shouldn't be lambasting the government for saying that. Uh, think of the opposite. The government says, we will negotiate with terrorists. Just uh, be a terrorist and come along. Uh, this debate has gone on over and over again, and I think it was Nixon who is quoted as saying that we will not negotiate for terrorists, and his memory re remains with us forever. Um, it, there was a debate soon after that about uh, <clears throat> what the new shape of the policy would be. Excuse me. <clears throat> And um, sometime around that time, it was, it was stated that the uh, new policy was do everything to effect the safe release of hostages without making any concessions. That's from the New York Times in 1976, which shows you that academics are pack rats. <laughs> <laughs> Government has to say, therefore, that it's, it's not going to negotiate with terrorists. The question is, what is it going to do and when? Talking is not surrendering. Talking is a means of attaining a goal when the opponent cannot be eliminated by force, or even when the opponent, when the opponent can be checked but not eliminated by force. I think those two conditions are important. <coughs> if you can't get rid of the, the guy on the other side and you don't have a millennial kind of, of uh, belief that uh, you're going to be able to do so in an acceptable amount of time, uh, then the only thing left is to is to talk. If you can't take it, you have to buy it. In other terms, Ari, Ari Severe, Yuri Severe said, "If who do you expect me to talk to if I can't talk to the enemy?" He had a good uh, reputation in practice of negotiation and and talking. But at the same time, uh, one has to expect to negotiate from strength, and that's a an established uh, position as well. Um, that is that the, uh, as uh, Audrey's paper has pointed out, that the negotiation takes place uh, when the parties are stalemated, and, and she uh, points out very nicely, politically stalemated, the strong is militarily, important as militarily uh, stalemated. Um, uh, but remember, too, that that applies to both sides. So a stalemate only takes place when both sides are unable to achieve their goal, and the other side is going to try to negotiate from strength, too, and hence the, uh, the challenging dynamics of the, the situation. So uh, talking and repressing, uh, repression, as another line, are not mutually exclusive. It is rare the cases where there are talks uh, only under the condition that they, everybody will lay down their arms. Uh, and, in fact, uh, those talks must have been preceded by a lot of negotiations uh, before that. So one would expect uh, military action to take place on both sides while talking and even negotiation uh, goes on. Those are a couple principles. Um, there's one point that I would like to emphasize, and, and uh, uh, Anthony has mentioned it uh, uh, particularly specifically. Uh, some of the points I'm making have been uh, it will be bouncing off the points that people made before, but I'll do it just so that you can get it the second time if you missed it the first. <laughs> um, we make an enormous mistake in talking about the opponent as a group, as a solid, unsplittable, uh, uh, united group. Uh, so uh, we talk about the Taliban, 
already a plural, um, as if it was one united force without any splits in it. Now, the order is correct in saying that splits can be unhelpful as well as helpful, but uh, it's important uh, uh, to try to look at talks as a means of splitting the group and getting to people who are talkable and isolate those who are not talkable. This, too, is a very difficult calculation. One has to uh, make sure that the talkables end up in the majority and that the untalkables are people who are outside uh, who can either be controlled or unable to uh, derail the deal when the deal is finally made. But splitting is important, and therefore thinking of splitting is important. Um, after all, just as one of many examples, the LTTE in, uh, in Sri Lanka were defeated because uh, one faction defected, uh, and then when they broke off their truce, the uh, Sri Lankan government was able to uh, arm better and uh, not talk, but in fact win, uh, defeat the LTTE. So uh, I think we have to ask ourselves uh, another question, and that is why should we uh, talk with the other side? A few of these have been mentioned, but a number of them uh, bear some repetition and some uh, uh, other new emphasis. First of all, simply to gain information. <clears throat> we want to know what they're thinking. We want to help them, curiously perhaps, to think a little bit more broadly and creatively. Very in, often when one talks to groups like this, they, they repeat things. They repeat things in their own minds. Uh, and uh, talking can, uh, with great difficulty, help them get behind the, that repetition uh, into reasons why, into lower things, uh, lower levels of, of thought, into, <coughs> as Roger Fisher would say, into interests rather than positions. Second of all, we want to sow doubts. We want to have them uh, ask themselves whether what they're doing is the proper path to what they would like to achieve. Uh, and whether they can hang on that long, uh, and whether the means that they use are worth uh, the action that they take, and worth uh, eventually the loss of, of popular support as well. <coughs> Third, uh, we talk with terrorists and uh, extremists because it's necessary sometimes. Sometimes it's the only way to get to at least a part of what we want, and we find ourselves in the, we, I assume we think of ourselves as the state, find ourselves as in the position where uh, talking is, is the, the sole path. Remember that whenever we talk about reasons why or problems facing, we're talking not only about the state, we always re kind of identify with the state, but also with the terrorists who have the same kind of problems to face and the same kind of decision to make, uh, when, why, how should I talk. Uh, we talk, uh, another reason to talk is possibly to end violence, don't change the ends, uh, but rather to uh, demote the struggle from a violent struggle or a terrorist struggle uh, to a political struggle, even though one can't talk them out of their, their goals. In other words, a conflict management type of, of aim rather than a conflict resolution. We want to talk to, it may sound a little wimpy and silly, but it's important because it, uh, willingness to talk gives us a moral high ground. They live on the moral high ground, particularly if they're religiously inspired people. I mean, they're right next to God. Uh, in fact, Joseph Coney is God. He said, you don't have to pray. Why pray? Because I'm here. Um, so uh, willingness to talk, a declared willingness to talk, uh, 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 occupies the moral high ground, and that plays into some of the positive conditions, the context, context the political stalemate that this uh, Audrey's paper talks about. It undercuts the extremists uh, who are trying to keep their hold on the moral high ground. Uh, another reason to talk is because we want to bring in, to buy in the mediator. We want to improve our relations with a mediator, and it has been, has been pointed out, talks are most unlikely to take place without the presence of a third party, at least to get the other parties in touch with each other. And finally, we want to talk because we want to split uh, the terrorists. If we can't sow doubts everywhere, maybe we can sow doubts among part of them. So uh, we uh, not to negotiate uh, is, or 
negotiate is not to uh, encourage uh, terrorism or extremism or to re betray it, but rather to overcome it, a path among others. In rational terms, the bargaining dynamics are simple and straightforward. The state wants the extremists to give up their terrorist means. In exchange for what? In sum, for a better chance to get less of what they want by using other lesser means. These terms of trade are scarcely appealing. Unless a new condition is introduced, the impossibility of getting all of what they want by terrorist tactics. This means that the possibility for the extremists of achieving current goals must be convincingly blocked, and also that the possibility of achieving at least something of those goals by alternative means must be convincingly open. Any other terms are of no appeal to the parties. Engagement and negotiation are both about means and ends and about impossibilities and possibilities. Thanks very much to, uh, to all of our panelists for their, their comments. I'd like to uh, open the next uh, stage of this by posing a question to each of our panelists, and some of these are going to overlap, and I'm just going to lay these out to all four of them, give them a chance to comment, and then we'll go to your questions from the floor. Uh, first of all, uh, Audrey Cronin. Audrey, one thing that you addressed in your paper that you didn't have time to get to in your oral comments had to do with how terrorist groups differ or don't differ from other uh, practitioners of political violence, such as uh, uh, guerrilla warfare movements. In fact, you cite at one point a formulation that Bill Zartman came up with about articulation, motivation, and so on, and, and make the point that terrorist groups tend to be stuck in, in one stage. And, and my, I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to comment a little bit more about to what extent the things you've covered elsewhere in your in your talk, you know, are, are unique to terrorist groups as a, as opposed to a more generally applicable. And to challenge you just a bit on your formulation in the paper, I mean, how would you <coughs> categorize a group like the FLN during the Algerian War for Independence, where uh, they resorted to just terrorism after they lost a, a basically a guerrilla warfare campaign against the French army, or perhaps look at the PKK as one that has sort of drifted back and forth between these different forms of political violence. Um, my questions to the other three panelists all overlap a bit because they all have to do with Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, topic A at the moment. Peter Bergen, um, you, you had quite a long list of uh, unpropitious circumstances, starting with, <laughs> with uh, Audrey's uh, criteria and then adding some of your own. Um, am I to uh, conclude from this, although you didn't state it as a conclusion explicitly, that Basically, negotiation is a lost cause in Afghanistan. Um, uh, or if not, uh, please give us the encouraging side of your observations. Uh, if so, then what do you see as the end game there if it's not going to be negotiation? Um, Anthony Juanis, um, you sounded a little bit less negative on this uh, than Peter was. Am I correct in that? <coughs> Uh, but what I'd li like you to comment on is if, if there is a role for negotiations in, in um, the Afghan conflict, what about the structure of them? Are we talking about getting a whole bunch of parties around one big round table, or are we talking about separate negotiations uh, involving some of these, these various uh, players? And finally, Bill Zartman, you did not want to talk about rightness, but I'll, I'll raise that, and we want to take advantage of your presence on this panel as one of the truly uh, leading experts on international negotiations whose work through the years has developed concepts like ripeness that have become common currency among those who have followed in your footsteps. And I'd like you to apply that concept again to Afghanistan. And it, or if we were to apply it, what would be the sorts of things you would look for in particular in evaluating that as a ripe or unripe situation? Audrey? Okay. Um, Paul, You've, you've touched upon one of the most difficult elements of the field, as you well know, because uh, you're extremely expert in it and uh, have done it for many, many years. So um, it doesn't surprise me that you found this sort of Achilles heel of what we study. But I think that it's possible to make um, a kind of a rational distinction between these types of violence, insurgency, guerrilla, uh, and uh, terrorism, because I see them as being on a kind of a continuum. Um, terrorism is a type of violence that primarily uh, targets um, civilians and um, is usually uh, engaged in by smaller groups. 
But that doesn't mean that insurgencies and guerrilla groups don't engage in terrorism. Guerrilla groups or insurgencies um, are, tend to be larger, tend to hold territory, at least temporarily, uh, tend to operate as a military unit, um, tend to have broader support, and most importantly, are strong enough to attack military <coughs> targets. So of that continuum of violence, I see terrorism as being the least legitimate. In, in, insurgent groups are more legitimate because they tend to have a broader support and a territorial control and some sort of broader mobilized popular um, involvement. Terrorism is a tactic that it doesn't surprise me. It, it, it fits very well with my way of looking at it that the FLN, after they had lost, resorted to engaging in terrorism because they're trying – a lot of times – what a terrorist group is trying to do is to mobilize that third part of the triangle to try to gain attention, to use symbolic violence when they haven't mobilized in the more traditional ways. So um, they do overlap, but I do think that um, probably the key most important distinction between them is the type of targeting that they engage in. And secondly, I would say, um, also extremely important, is the degree to which there is legitimacy of the type of violence that it is. If you're a broad-based insurgent group, um, there's more of a popular foundation to what you're doing, and whether or not you support the insurgent group or the state, this is a different kind of um, war than uh, that which a terrorist group engages in. This is one of the reasons why I've argued for many years, and obviously have lost the argument, um, that, that the United States should not be calling al-Qaeda a global insurgency, because that uh, type of terminology, um, well, for, you know, for for one thing, it in, implies a kind of a mobilization and also a connection between many of the individual elements that uh, I would dispute in many cases. But secondly, um, it's a much more legitimate form of violence. It would be much better to talk about the use of terrorism, which is, uh, by virtually anyone's uh, definition, the act that is, not the cause for which it is undertaken, but the act itself of targeting individual civilians uh, as a form of symbolic violence is virtually always considered to be highly illegitimate. Thank you. Peter? Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, you know, of course, as you know, negotiations are, of course, uh, desirable, and uh, I'm just posing, uh, I guess, a little bit of skepticism. We've already had several years of negotiations uh, and back channel uh, between the Afghan government and elements of the Taliban, and has yielded precisely nothing. And I think part of the problem is that you're looking at three levels of conflict, and Audrey can perhaps how uh, this is a fairly unusual set of uh, uh, conflicts. One is an intra Pashtun conflict between essentially rural Pashtuns and urban Pashtuns, which you can cartoon as the Gilzais versus the Durranis, but basically, uh, you know, the Karzais are on one side of this and, and, and the Taliban on the other. That's the first level of the conflict. The second level of the conflict is you've had various kinds of uh, civil war based on ethnic lines in Afghanistan uh, going back for decades. And that is, in terms of the spoilers that I left off of this, the Northern Alliance, uh, again, a sort of shorthand, would be a very large spoiler for any deal uh, going forward. And, and finally, you've got a regional conflict, which has also been going on for years, where for all sorts of actors, Pakistan, India, Iran, um, Russia, uh, which makes it all the more complicated. So. To do a deal in that kind of situation um, is going to be complex. What kind of deal, just to partially an answer your question <coughs> posed to Anthony, I mean, I think Iraq is a very uncertain, the analogy, uh, is, there are a lot of differences, but one of the reasons that we didn't lose in Iraq um, are, is that we did multiple, hundreds of <coughs> ceasefires, hundreds of local ceasefires with lots of different groups. And that probably is the most promising way forward, picking up on something that Anthony said, I think, rather than a top-level deal uh, with Mullah Omar and, and others. Thank you. Anthony? Uh, let me point out that the, the Pakistanis have made deals with the Taliban uh, at, a, at a field level, at a local level, and they've done so with, um, with a, a lack of success. The folks that they negotiated with went back to fighting. Uh, in some cases, the order that they would establish in the communities they went back to were ones that people found objectionable or, or otherwise problematic and controversial. They were trying to get Taliban-like order without the fight. Um, so how you do this does matter. At the same time, I would say that um, part of the problem was that they were doing this in the absence of a national level, uh, regional level, strategic, perhaps grand bargain or grand plan. 
So I would say that there would be not one table, but, but probably several different kinds of tables that would have to happen in some sort of loose uh, simultaneity. At the local level, I think uh, our Marines, our, our Army military, ISAF folks will be engaged on a, on a sort of battalion but by battalion, cell by cell effort to get people off the, off the field of combat. And those negotiations are important. They don't change the entire conflict landscape. They don't change the political order. They reduce the conflictivity. They reduce the lethality of the conflict. Uh, they make it safer for ISAF to operate. They make it safer for Afghan civilians to live uh, and not face, not become uh, enmeshed in the crossfire. Um, there, there is probably a different sort of negotiation that has to happen with, with Afghan tribal and civil society. And I'm using those terms sort of synonymously. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that the tribal uh, level of, of existence of life in Afghanistan has become, uh, in some ways, the, the sole bearer of legitimate uh, institutions in that country and to some extent have been co-opted and overrun by, by people with weapons, by the warlords, by, by, uh, by the Taliban, by others. Uh, part of part of the deal then has to be then uh, getting them to back away entirely from Taliban support, uh, make them an empowered part of the reintegration of people back into some sort of <coughs> honorable and economically feasible civilian life. All of that has to happen under the umbrella of some sort of a grand bargain. And that grand bargain can look like many things, but I think ideally it would look like the end of the political role of the armed groups who have run Afghanistan for the last few decades, uh, whichever side they come from. So it would probably mean uh, something that's connected to uh, Pakistan's involvement, something connected to the United States, uh, some exit for some top-level people, uh, some exile or otherwise for them, but it would mean a, a new uh, regional order that, that, that combines uh, real reconciliation and reintegration with with uh, a real uh, different sort of political order in that country, supported by their neighbors. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I, I would agree with the continuum, first of all, uh, between various types of conflict and, uh, and uh, at the extreme uh, terrorism. Um, I don't think we should be squeamish about the definition of terrorism or the use of the term although apparently we don't have terrorism anymore in this administration. We only have extremism, and we don't negotiate. We only engage. That's why I called the book Engaging Extremists. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be up with the times, I mean, after all. Um, but terrorism is the use of violence against civilian targets um, it, for the purpose of uh, influencing uh, official decisions. Um, and that last part means that there is a separate subject for state terrorism, lest uh, somebody want to bring that up, which is a subject in itself. But we're talking about extremist groups using that, uh, those tactics against uh, the state. It is a weapon of desperation. You don't win battles by terrorism. You win uh, minds and will uh, by, by terrorism. So... Um, it's, uh, it, it's a definable object, and uh, uh, all kind of groups, whether they be freedom fighters or, or bad guys, um, have used something that one can, can dispassionately call uh, uh, terrorist. Um, terrorism. Um, since it is a, me a weapon of desperation, uh, if one renounces terrorism, one means that at, at least one is thrown back into normal violent contact, but, uh, combat, but uh, since it was a weapon of desperation, that must mean that the people who are, who are so doing had lost their faith in, violent, uh, in normal violent con uh, combat. So uh, it, it's a bit of a, uh, a, a bet to know uh, what happens when one changes the means and what does this mean in the, in the mind of the person or the party that agrees with it. Afghanistan. I don't know anything about Afghanistan. Um, I, I think that it's important, as, as Anthony said, to think of separate types of negotiation. If we say there's no negotiation or, or talking, if, if we say there's no 
approach, no engagement short of, of uh, Mullah Omar, uh, then we're getting nowhere by definition, by his definition, uh, and in, in practice as, as well. But I think one wants to talk with whatever groups that one can get to engage. We, the discussion frequently runs about uh, getting uh, the troops to defect. Um, but I think we also have to think about vertical divisions, that is, uh, getting uh, 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 people in charge of various geographic sectors to come over to, uh, uh, to a cooperation of some kind with the, the government. The question remains, too, how cooperable, how, yeah, how uh, uh, co-opt- co-optable um, are some of these groups? Is, is Hekmetyar, whom we've never loved very much over the past couple of decades, uh, it, it, cooperable on anything but his own terms, which uh, have never been very acceptable. The question further then would be, are there people under him? Are there lieutenants, not just levels, but subgroups uh, uh, that uh, one can, can talk with and deal with? It would be dangerous for them. He's not a friendly character. It would be dangerous for them to try to do so, but uh, uh, that uh, may be the path to uh, to breaking up that single group notion that I had, had talked about. Um, uh, what I think uh, the point that Anthony raises as well is very important, and that is we need, to, if one gets a deal of some kind, one needs to consolidate, one needs to follow through, one needs to not just simply hand off a piece of territory to the other person, uh, but rather to bring them in as well. In other words, uh, the end of negotiation is not the deal, but the the follow-through, the the consolidation. The one thing I would disagree with, uh, Anthony, is uh, he said the end of of the uh, political role of armed groups that have run Afghanistan in the last couple decades. The dates are wrong. They've run Afghanistan since the 1830s, as the British and probably before when we weren't as well uh, informed about Afghanistan. It's a tough area to try to look for a deal in. I thought you didn't know anything about Afghanistan. Right. right. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Can I – I I didn't answer your question. About about, ripeness. About ripeness, yes. Yes. Uh, Very quickly, we can take it apart if you want to. I I think one would look for a stalemate on the ground. That that is, there are some parts that – the plural they have that we can't get, and there are larger parts, a respectable part, that uh, the other side, the government and the military support has. And, uh, again, uh, Audrey's point, which is very important, uh, a a political stalemate as well. That is the feeling that they are losing ground, that it's harder for them to hold on to their territory um, uh, than admittedly they have, even though it's impossible for us to take it, uh, but uh, nonetheless, the uh, the wave of sympathy, if you will, uh, is not running in their favor. I thought there might be a, a, glimpse, of, a glimpse of hope for a hurting stalemate in one of the quotes attributed to General McChrystal in the infamous Rolling Stone article, in which he said, uh, as I recall, the Taliban doesn't have the initiative, but neither do we. Um, but... Uh, now, but you'd need something like that from a Taliban side. Correct. Uh, so maybe McChrystal is wrong. <laughs> That's the <a> beginning. <laughs> okay, we have uh, about uh, well, pro- close to a half hour um, of um, for questions. I see we have two microphones. Um, I'm not clear what the current view of the administration is towards negotiation in Afghanistan. We are getting mixed signals from you know, Holbrook and Clinton and others. I just wonder if you could maybe clarify this. Uh, Peter mentioned you know, that back channels are been open for several years. I just wonder if he could elaborate on what he thinks is happening just now. Well, before Peter comments, I, I would just note your question seems to be of a piece with uh, reporting in the paper this morning about how Ambassador Holbrook was uh, getting treated rather roughly um, uh, before I think it was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, whose members were saying, "You don't have a strategy. You don't have an approach." But yeah. Peter, do you have uh, observation about uh, current administration? I, I, I don't this? really on the current administration because, I mean, I don't, I, but on the question of what kind of negotiations are happening, obviously the negotiation at the end of the day has to be with the Afghan government and, and, and um, the people that have attended these uh, 
negotiations in Mecca have basically been people that have gone through Guantanamo uh, or, or have otherwise uh, become part of the Afghan political process. Uh, they are widely regarded as people who can't deliver the Taliban, and the Taliban keep saying that. Um, so, um, of course, you want to be talking, and uh, talking is not surrendering. Uh, but the people who are doing the talking right now are not really empowered to make any deals. I think just one further comment about the current administration posture, and obviously I don't speak for them, but um, I, I think the if we had an administration spokesman, um, uh, that person would find a way of saying we are we are flexible, um, and we are, as you know, looking ahead toward another policy review toward the end of this year, uh, at which point uh, probably there'll be more presidential decisions about what happens in 2011 with regard not only to the military side but the diplomatic side. So uh, I think your, your question reflects probably decisions not yet made. First person over here, please. Good, uh, good afternoon. I'm Mr. Lloyd from the University of Maryland. Uh, we are talking today about terrorists and discovers issues about insurgency and terrorism. Um, you, did our speakers try to delineate uh, what is insurgency and what is terrorism. But in my mind, I think there's, there's really no big difference between the two of these. Um, we have, let, let me cite samples of countries which insurgency and terrorism go hand in hand. After World War II, the Communist Party of the Philippines already existed, and to this day it is one of the, it's the longest insurgent movement in Asia, and still there is no seems to be solution in sight. And at the same time, we have the Muslim rebellion movement in the South, like uh, Islamic Liberation Front and the National Muslim, Moral National Liberation Front, all of this. And it seems that all solutions trying to dissuade and to uh, convince rebels to get into the mainstream of government system is not working. And the Philippines is really different from the case of Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran, whatever it may be. The Philippines is a former U.S. colony. The Philippines has all the institutions of, of um, the United States, democracy-wise, civil service, military, everything. Now, as experts in um, terrorism and insurgency, do you still think there's a solution to solve all of this, given these long years of insurgency and um, all the talks never really work at all, even incorporating them into the Constitution, giving them uh, autonomous region in the South. And to this day, it's still getting stronger and stronger with all the aid and assistance given by the government. It still is not working. So I'm asking as experts, do you think there's a solution to this? Thank you. Okay. I, I, I don't think any of us up here have a claim to expertise on conflict within the Philippines specifically, but I invite anyone on the panel to... Uh, to apply some of your general framework, and, and Audrey, certainly you got into this somewhat in your response to my question, um, that might be applicable to Philippine. Anthony? Oh, I'll just uh, say at the outset that insurgency and terrorism are, are not the same thing uh, by, any, uh, by any definitional. Um, uh, I would say that insurgents can use terrorism. Terrorists uh, may uh, occasionally become insurgents. Uh, both can become sort of conventional forces and, and target uh, only other belligerents. So, so there is a big mix, and it's, it's, always, uh, it's always a mistake to try to lump everything together that needs to be synthetically taken apart, I think, and analytically it, taken apart. Excuse and, me. and I might add, just pretending for a moment to be an expert on the southern Philippines, um, you, know, you were lumping things together, but... You mentioned a couple of the groups. You got the MILF, the MNLF, and then the Abu Sayyaf group, which is which is the the one I think of, of most direct concern to terrorism experts. And I'm, I'm sure you would agree that those are very different uh, fish, even though they're uh, swimming in the same kettle. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, over here. Yeah. Um, the U.S. has a policy of not negotiating with. Uh, Could you identify yourself? Please? Oh, my name is Amr. I'm from American University, the same program that Professor Winnie teaches. Uh, I just finished this summer, so. Um, finished yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll talk. We'll talk. Uh, I think he has to answer the question. I'm not finished yet. Okay, I'm not finished. Um, so the U.S. has a policy of not negotiating with terrorists, uh, but uh, they supplied, they supported the militias in Somalia to overthrow the Islamic government, Islamic courts in 2006. The same case in Afghanistan. 
uh, Taliban has killed American soldiers. They have targeted American interests. Uh, they're not popular with their community. Um, and yet the U.S. has had some shift of granting them amnesties if they're willing to renounce violence and recognize certain, certain things. In the case of Hamas, uh, they're not targeting U.S. soldiers. They're not targeting U.S. interests. Uh, they're very popular with their community. They were voted by the majority in 2005. And they're willing to renounce violence and recognize the state of Israel if they recognize them and give them a just state. So I see more pluses than minuses in comparison to the U.S. policies. Uh, my question is, how does the U.S. define what a terrorist group is? And after they define it, how do they define their exceptions to negotiate with them? Okay, I, I'm, I'm glad you raised uh, one of the Middle Eastern issues. I was going to steer the discussion to that if no one else did. Um, I'll give you my short take on this and then invite my co-panelists uh, on this. On something like U.S. posture toward Hamas uh, or related issues with regard to the territories, I think it would be futile to try to understand or explain U.S. policy in terms of abstract definitions about who's a terrorist or who isn't. We're talking about much different political pressures and considerations that, that uh, are involved here, um, which we could go into if you want to go in that direction. Uh, but with that preface, does any of my fellow panelists want to comment on that? I would draw your attention to Paul Pillar's book on the evolution of U.S. Uh, policy with respect to terrorism. It came out in, what, 1999? 2000, 2001. 2001, but before September 11th. It's an excellent book. It uh, talks all about the many different definitions of terrorism that exist within our government. There is not one unified, agreed-upon definition. Elements are agreed upon, but there are slightly different, slight differences between different elements of the American government. And I would simply um, strongly urge you to read Paul's book. Okay. Can I? Can I still in print? Okay. Please, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't quite agree with that last formulation. Um, you mean the plug for my book. <laughs> <laughs> How shall I put okay. it now to get out of that? <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> The plug for the book is good. <laughs> um, it, definitions come in square boxes. Events don't come in square boxes. So we try to uh, base our policy on uh, concepts and definitions and a uh, number of different elements that go into policy making in, in each case. Uh, each case is not exactly sui generis. I don't. I think you can make analytically. A, uh, a distinctions, there are concepts and so on, but one has to recognize that there's a gap between the, the intellectual label and what happens on, on the ground. Cases are individual um, and have to be judged on the basis of the ingredients that go in. That said, I don't know why we are not talking to Hamas uh, at some level, and I certainly hope, would expect that we are, although at an unavowable uh, mm -hmm. level. And I would just add I concur with that, and it's going to have to be avowed at some point in my judgment. Next question over here. My name is Robert Dubois. I'm a security advisor. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the, the, uh, the discussion today. I think as a caveat, the one reason we avoid the definition of terrorism so closely is because we keep approaching it ourselves. I'm a retired service member, and I know uh, that uh, American policy – keeps dancing around the edges of, of doing violence. I mean, Hiroshima is a, a terrific example of violence against the civilians. Uh, we can't afford to embrace that definition because it qualifies us as terrorists. The question is for Peter. I loved your comment about we haven't lost in Iraq, or we didn't lose in Iraq, because of the hundreds of ceasefires, small ceasefires. It's a better approach than trying to deal with Mullah Omar or somebody uh, like Zarqawi. Do you think that we have a huge option here, and I'm, I'm biased, I think we have a huge option here from, from bottom-up approaching to dealing with the whole thing. I don't think that our administration or our approach is, is, uh, is uh, reaching enough folks. We can, we can touch a lot more people across the board. You have NGOs all over the, all over the region. And we can deal with more than just principle-to-principle uh, principle in the policymaking. Do you think we have an untapped uh, opportunity? And the short answer is yes. I mean, that's, that's what's in the process of happening, and, and that's what makes sense. I mean, most Taliban fighters are fighting a few miles from where they grew up. It's a very localized phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So even more than Iraq, I think that's probably the, 
know, the promising way forward. Okay, let's move on over here. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Mike Kraft, counterterrorism writer and former official in the State Department Counterterrorism Office. In view of some of the questions, I'm going to have to change mine a little bit. Just for the record, the State Department does have a clear definition in defining terrorism. It's primarily, um, as I call it, written into law, uh, violence by non-state actors perpetuated against civilians primarily for a, a, a political purposes. And Hamas and others were put on the terrorism list after a long, detailed uh, administrative record that had to st be written to stand up in courts. I know I was involved in drafting the original law and some of the uh, fighting with Justice Department in terms of writing with amounted to legal briefs. But this raises the question, and, and Audrey, maybe you got into this in, in your book, which I haven't read yet. But in, in differentiating in negotiations between groups that are mainly territorial, such as maybe the Basques and, and the PKK and others, and the more recent ideological groups like Al-Qaeda and even Hamas and Hezbollah, who in many ways have a broad ideological agenda. Uh, and I think the question comes up, A, how can you really satisfy their ends if it involves destruction of entire state, or in the case of Al-Qaeda, restoring the mythical caliph, uh, and at this point I, I disagree respectfully with Professor uh, Jartman that uh, I don't think uh, terrorism is a weapon of desperation for people whose main goal seems to be the revenge or restoring their honor or killing the other. I mean, it may be true of the territorial groups like the PKK, but I don't think so much of the ideological groups, and you also ignore the psychological factor. But anyway, uh, Audrey mentioned a key element, the triangle, the outside audience. So how would a government negotiate with a group such as Hamas without giving them um, more standing incentive? Because it seems to me that if, and I think you're right, the group is more likely to negotiate if they think their position is weakening, but when people do things like flotillas or Iran supplying missiles and rockets to Hezbollah, these groups will think they're on their ascendancy. So you know, some of the so-called peace movements may be counterproductive to trying to get negotiations going. And finally, the thing you didn't mention is the, the very difficult issue of negotiations when there's hostages involved. Uh, it's true the State Department and government has said they don't negotiate, and it's been modified, and I can give you a list of the changes I put together for a book. It sort of evolved to, we'll talk, but without letting ter uh, giving terrorists... Uh, you know, uh, tangible gains from it. So it's a very tricky area. Thank you. Uh, well, okay. I, I think we know each other, actually. When I was working at CRS, I used to call you all the time. So <laughs> nice to actually see you. Um, and I have great respect for your uh, questions and your expertise. Let me just say that I'm not implying that there's no definition, and I didn't mean to imply that uh, in the answer to the question about U.S. policy, only that there are slight differences of emphasis between different agencies. That doesn't mean that the State Department definition is incorrect. Uh, I just think it's fascinating because there is a certain degree of uh, shades of difference. Um, and then on the question of negotiable terms, that is much more uh, discussed and sort of uh, carefully analyzed in the book. I didn't really go into that here. But, um, you know, obviously the, the group that is engaged in negotiations has to have some sort of tangible negotiable terms. And if you look back through over the, all the many case studies, logically enough, those groups that have had some connection to territory or some interest in controlling territory – um, have had more success in terms of achieving uh, some sort of negotiable outcome, as have the states with which they're engaged. So when you're talking about these broader ideological questions, um, one of the key points that you have to determine right away is whether um, the terms that the group is trying to pursue the, the, are, are in any way um, realistic in the real world. I mean, it's almost like a tautology. You can't resolve uh, a difference of opinion unless there is some point on which you can resolve it. And so <laughs> it is true that uh, highly ideological groups that are um, oriented toward broad, vague ideas that would overturn the entire uh, international system have virtually never um, been successfully negotiated with. Let's go back here. Thank you. I'm Kay Ganeen with the Charity and Security Network. In late June, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of applying the prohibitions on material support of terrorism to uh, U.S. civil society groups that wanted to do training, uh, provide uh, advice and assistance towards uh, uh, conflict negotiation or, or uh, mediation services. 
Um, so whether you agree or disagree with uh, the court's finding, uh, that's their holding that that could be the policy, but not that it must be the policy. So my question is, uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, the smart policy to have for U.S. civil society organizations to be able to act as those third parties or to be able to engage in training and advice and assistance to violent actors to try to bring them uh, to the negotiation table? Anybody want to address that? Uh, I don't have the – I haven't read the – except the, the news reports about this, uh, so I, I don't have all of the reasoning and exactly what the – the, the judgment uh, uh, covered, but uh, as I read about it in the newspaper, it's mindless. Uh, it's terribly important to uh, be able to talk with people on the part of uh, NGOs, and sometimes it's even necessary to train uh, extremist groups about how to negotiate. Uh, in, in Mozambique, uh, Renamo, it didn't know what its aims were, didn't know how to talk to people, and, and needed some kind of, of training, even by those who were friendly with the state, the state's position, to get the, uh, the uh, Renamo to know how to state its position and negotiate. And we finally got an agreement out, and there are a number of other experiences like that. So I, I hope that uh, NGOs at least can continue their activities. There's no question that for organizations like yours, that court decision puts you in an awful bind. I mean, I, I think the ultimate fix is there will need to be legislation to amend the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, which is what uh, laid out the material support provisions, and reword it in an amendment to make it clear it is not to be construed as uh, criminalizing uh, the sort of dialogue with a group that is aimed at trying to persuade that group into peaceful channels as opposed to violent ones. It, it clearly is, is a, an unfortunate counterproductive effect of the law, whether from a strictly legal point of view, and I'm not a lawyer, the court decision made legal sense. Uh, I think we need new legislation to fix that. Thank you. Chick Dombach with the Alliance for Peace Building. Kay asked the question that I originally came up to ask, but we agreed that she would ask that one, and I'll ask the follow-up. <laughs> uh, uh, Obviously involved with civil society, the NGO community, uh, you've already uh, indicated some of the, uh, the, the, the value of uh, being able to, uh, to talk with, with terrorist organizations. Uh, just appreciate if you comment just a little bit more on the, the difference between official government talking with terrorist organizations and the special role that civil society NGOs can play, because uh, there's a, a very different framework and a different dynamic to that, and, and I would appreciate your comments on that. Anyone? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say that, <clears throat> on one hand, talking uh, as a uh, intelligence agents uh, might do, making contact uh, for gaining information and so on, uh, even by U.S. government uh, uh, officials. Uh, um, it, it's, it's still something that's, that's important to, uh, to learn more about what the other side is, is after. But that said, for the most part, many of the things, the advantage, some of the advantages that I mentioned uh, uh, opening up their way of thinking, kind of getting information, uh, that kind of thing, are best done and probably first done by, by NGOs. There, there, there is this fine line, and uh, we, we don't like to think of spooks, but thank goodness in many cases for their being there, a uh, fine line where uh, uh, it, uh, the, the government uh, gets itself in, would get itself engaged more than it wants to if it uh, un undertook those activities. And, and uh, as we know now, a track two or whatever you want to call it uh, has an important, a very important role to play. Anyone else on that? I'd only add that we're speaking on a kind of a shorthand that's not really completely reflective of what negotiations entail. I mean, there are always different types of levels of negotiation or talks or contact and, and all of those um, have their uses and I think are, are potentially very helpful. I might add just a little thing to that, that uh, uh, civil society and NGO work uh, with, with uh, belligerents is extremely important. Traditionally, I think on the track two side, uh, 
it's been with supporters of the other group, perhaps, or civilian uh, sectors on, on, on the other side. But increasingly, it's become uh, that, that the NGOs set the table. They act as intermediaries. They play a number of roles that they have not traditionally been uh, given responsibility for. And it's important to, I think, make space for all of those different things, especially when they are filling a vacuum that the parties themselves um, cannot do on their own. Okay, let's get a question on this side. Hi, uh, Aaron Schein, UMass Amherst. Um, just with respect to um, Professor Cronin's um, caveat that a diffuse group is harder to negotiate with, um, I was wondering if I could field the opinions um, on the drone campaign in Pakistan, which um, is a decapitation technique for terrorists and I guess has also a very high civilian death toll. I think the conservative estimate is 50 to 1. Well, the, um, the latter issue, I think, goes beyond the scope of this discussion, <laughs> uh, especially since we've only got about five minutes left. But my observation uh, as it pertains to the uh, question of do you have somebody to negotiate with is I think most of the targets we're talking about there are part of um, especially hardcore al-Qaeda central with which the prospects for negotiating for the reasons that Audrey lays out in her paper are, are virtually nil or, or there, there's nothing to be gained. There, there's nothing, there's not a negotiable objective there. So I, I don't really think it, it, um, it spoils anything as far as negotiating opportunities are concerned. I don't know if anyone would disagree with that. Um, this may be our last question over here. Uh, hi, I'm Benedict Teagard, and I'm with the Stimson Center here in Washington. Um, we talked a lot today about uh, the way in which the politics between the two parties uh, are important and also about how military fighting keeps going. But I was wondering if, uh, briefly, even though we could probably stay here all day and talk about it, how economics might affect uh, these negotiations, both in terms of uh, terrorist or insurgent organizations which use terrorist tactics, uh, can be part of war economies, and also just about their funding in general and the way in which uh, these groups support themselves either through illicit means or through uh, any sort of uh, funding they can gather, how that affects the, um, the negotiations and, and what a state can do or international actors can do uh, on the economic side, which would also be uh, part of setting the table. Thanks. Audrey, thank you. Um, that's a really broad question. I mean, I could talk about that for another hour. You were right. Uh, economics, they're extremely important, everything from the question of terrorist financing, which has, uh, you know, been very heavily emphasized ever since September 11th and cutting off resources to an individual group for using violence, to broader situations where states have increased the uh, local um, – uh, sort of viability of local communities, for example, has happened in Northern Ireland with a tremendous influx of uh, funding and um, financial support from uh, the UK government. Uh, you know, economics can play lots of different roles when it comes to priming uh, groups for um, negotiations or, more importantly, I think, um, providing an incentive for the popular uh, support that may or may not be in favor of the talks to be interested in. Um, getting beyond the violence. So uh, those are just a few points that occur to me. It's an extremely broad and important issue. Join me in uh, thanking our panel, and thank you all for, uh, for coming out. <laughs>